raise within the Yarralaro Nation, stretching from Durabimi in Queensland to Wild Gaduga and Braywarrow in New South Wales. And I would like to introduce him to today's um, NATO. Um, My name is Gila, um, that's my Yualeo tribal name. Um, my father's a Gomorrah man and my mother's Yualeo. So we're way out there where there's no water. Um, and things are pretty tough out there right now. It's not just for Aboriginal people, but farmers are all moving out. And uh, we're going to have a very desert inland country as it stands right now and the way it's progressing. Um, all of this you see around you, um, I was very much involved in a lot of it. This part over here is what really stimulated my, um, my interest in getting out there active. Well, first of all, uh, as a young fellow growing up on, on an Aboriginal camp, uh, we lived in tin shacks and tents and no running water, and we lived off mainly the water that was in the river, boiled all the water. Um, then Walgut, where I grew up, there was a white line in the street just above where the Chinese shops were. And uh, that's where Aboriginal people were restricted to, up to 1969. And so, interestingly enough, I did a, a television interview for uh, the ABC, talking about the moon landing um, about a month ago. And one of the things they, they were shocked at um, when we were talking about that uh, moon landing, um, it just so happened that 1969 is when they took away the mission managers, what we call the commandants of the who were controlling Aboriginal people on missions. We were locked up in missions, not allowed to move, no freedom of movement, uh, no right of association. And if you white kids were to mix up with an Aboriginal kid on the street prior to 1969, you could be arrested and charged for uh, consorting with an Aboriginal. Um, so that was 1969. And it was illegal, it was in a legal document, and the Aboriginal Protection Board, Aboriginal Welfare Board, and uh, that Aboriginal Welfare Board locked us up and made us prisoners in this state. I'm interested in these names that you have um, NADOC has put up, uh, Truth, Treaty and Voice. First of all, I'll start off with Truth. Quite frankly, White Australia is not ready for the truth. Yeah? You're not going to be able to deal with the truth. There are a lot of farmers in this country whose descendants still own those farms all over this country. And quite frankly, what they did to Aboriginal people is quite shocking. And they cleared the land, and that's how they got the land. And the way you clear the land of the people is you shoot it. The most notorious areas of, of the country is this area. From Kempsey, up into the mountains around Tenterfield, Armadale, uh, Dorigal, right through to Ballinaria and into southern Queensland up here to the Tambourine Mountains. There's a book called Domesticating Resistance. And this fellow, uh, he wrote about what uh, the people did when they came here, the, the invaders, the British and the squatters. And what they did is, right throughout this area is that they laid poison. They laid strychnine and arsenic in the water holes where they knew the Aboriginal people were um, getting their water from. And there are many, many water holes, and I've been with the elders here from Kempsey and from Armadale, and we, walk, we went through a lot of this country, the old men from up here at uh, Woodenbong, back in the 70s, as a young man, when, we were, when I was involved in the Black Power Movement, I came up here to motivate them, to talk to people about what the Black Power Movement was all about. Interestingly enough, those old men actually took us out and showed me some of the water holes where the people are dead. And quite frankly, you've still got bones of Aboriginal people laying around at those water holes who have never been buried. It's the same as out in my country, at Rewarrina. Um, nine miles north of Rewarrina, a place called Hospital Creek. In 1848, a man by the name of Con Bride, who was one of the first white people in the area, organised for these white young parts in that area who were setting up squatters. They went into the area and they went to So people couldn't go. So where the men were, they went down to on the river near Brewarna and they shot over a hundred and something men. 
we know that number, it's around about that figure. And then up uh, basically nine miles north of that, there's an other area, they now call it Hospital Creek, very appropriate name. And they killed all the men, women and children, all the old people and the women and children. And um, I've had people out there, I've taken bone specialists out, we've identified those places. And one woman um, from my mob survived that, and I'm a direct descendant of that old woman. Her name is Ellen Lennon. She died in 1941 at Rewarrenet. Mission aged 100, and we, we reckon about 101, 102 years of age. And my mother is still alive. Mum, my mother listened to the stories and she told her and she kept crying and she used to dance every night and sing in her language because she was on country and she wasn't far away from where her mother, bones were still laying and other members of her family. Now in this country, when you talk about this whole thing about truth telling, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You have no idea of what's going to come out if, when we do it. Aboriginal people in this country will never heal until we start telling the truth, until we start hearing that. Um, there are, ev there's evidence down here, um, I won't name any particular place at this point, but I've seen the document where you have Aboriginal people dead on the south side of that, um, on the south side of your Ballina River just here, um, on the Richmond River. And those people have never been buried, yeah. There are families who are direct descendants of them, but there's also families living in the Ballina region and in the Evans Ed region whose families were responsible for killing them. And they, they just left them there to die, and left, left their bodies to rot. Um, so if we, when we get into this truth telling, this is the sort of stuff that's come, gonna come out. Now one other very important thing for Aboriginal people, when we did the land rights, when we started the land rights movement in the 1960s, one of the interesting things was that we really knew in our heart that something was wrong. And so when we started talking about land rights, there was a great deal of, of I suppose, of angst and worry from the politicians. Yeah? And we were all, I was 19, uh, sorry, I was 17 when I got involved in the Black Power Movement. And then I became a leader of that Black Power Movement. And by, uh, by the age of 19, we were just taking on people and we were walking in Sydney Street, Melbourne Street, Brisbane Street. And the great thing about that was we had a lot of support from students, university students, a lot of uh, human rights people. And um, there were probably about 100 blackfellas walking around, but about 3,000 white people walking the streets with us. Yeah. And it was the non-Aboriginal people that really made it count and made people sit and listen because we began to get that support and people wanted to know the truth. People wanted to know what really went on in this country. They want to know what, what happened to Aboriginal people and why Aboriginal people are like they are. And that's what shocked the politicians. And uh, it scared them because those, those non-Aboriginal kids who were at university, they came from you know the background of doctors, lawyers, very high profile politicians, high profile entertainers. And so these people gave us the support that we needed. And that's what drew the attention of the media to what we were doing. And so we had politicians then start saying, uh, in the parliament in, 19, in 1971, was the first one, where uh, one of the senior politicians in the parliament said, Aborigines, just because they have um, any strain of blood in their vein that may be of Aboriginal answers, it doesn't mean that they have a right to land. Well, unfortunately, in 1992, the Mabo case handed down a decision that said Aboriginal people still own this land, all of it. Not a little bit, but all of it. And in that High Court decision in Mabo, when they handed down that decision, it sent panic right through Australia. It also sent panic through England. And one may ask, why England? Well, the very reason why England panicked was simply because Australia don't own this land. You, you don't own this land, none of you. Yeah? It's between Aboriginal people, the Torres Strait Islanders, and the Queen of England. No one else, the Crown. But the Queen is only the head of 13 families, and they are the Crown. And so when we talk about um, getting a voice into the parliament. We had a voice. 
we had a voice from 1973 right through to 1984. And in that voice, we have another word in there called treaty. Now, I was instrumental in working to get that voice up in Canberra. I sat on committees, government committees in Canberra, and we initiated an election of a black parliament in 1973. 1973, that black parliament became known as the National Aboriginal Consultative Committee because we were consulting direct to the parliament on all matters relating to Aborigines. I got out of that and in 81, um, I went back and studied law and became a lawyer. I'm not a practicing lawyer anymore, but I have that distinction of being one. Um, I gave it up because I didn't want to swear at my allegiance to the Crown. And that was what you've got to do, when you swear allegiance to the bar when you become a lawyer. Um, so I, I still go into courts, I still practice in courts, when um, in courts in New South Wales, Supreme Court, um, allow me to practice and, and go in. So I go in as a friendly fellow into the courts. And I'm arguing cases about um, land, land ownership, um, still to this day. Now, what we have, though, is a, is a bit of a problem. When the Australian government uh, realised that the native title, um, sorry, the Mabo decision handed down the decision that Aboriginal people still have interest in the country, in all the land and water and airspace. And very few people realise that now that Aboriginal people are getting ownership of land around the coastal waters, those aeroplanes that fly from overseas into this country will now have to pay compensation to Aboriginal people to play, fly their planes across their airspace. Otherwise, they will not land an aeroplane in Australia. Yep. And that's one of the things that Aboriginal people are beginning to look at now, right now, and start talking about it. You guys, you guys are going to realise this within the next five years, how significant the power Aboriginal people have. We may be a minority right now. We may be and appear to be insignificant. You know, these things here could be seen as tokenism, but they're not tokenism. The fact is, Australia has to come to terms with the fact that we are here, we've always been here, and we're not going anywhere. And the fact also is that legally, in this country, unless you begin to talk with Aboriginal people, not much development is going to happen in this country without our say-so. And Aboriginal people are starting to force that issue on. The parliaments in this country have a problem with that, and the problem is, we represent between 2 to 4% of the total population, but we are 100% owners of this country. And that's something that has to be looked at very clearly. And so what we need when we begin to talk about uh, discussions, talking about truth, uh, talking about the treaty, um, the treaty itself is going to put a lot of relationship in place in terms of co-management of this country and sharing of the wealth from the natural resources. But let me just focus on the treaty now, just for a minute. When they started the treaty, I was a public prosecutor in New South Wales in criminal law. I put a lot of people in jail. Um, and one of the things that um, came to me was, some of the fellow judges said to me, you should be down there heading that treaty process and being the boss and, and directing that discussion. As it turns out, the National Aboriginal Conference came to me in 1981, went to my boss, the Attorney General of New South Wales, and said, we would like for him to come down and take up responsibility for the treaty. Can we have him and can we, can we have a transfer <laughs> arrangement? So anyway, Frank Walker, who was the Attorney General at the time of New South Wales, he came and he said, well, they want you down there to help uh, organise the treaty and get some things going. So I became the National Director to develop a treaty um, program and to develop the, a framework for the negotiation of a treaty uh, throughout Australia with Aboriginal people, the Commonwealth of Australia and the state governments. Before that, I said to them, there's no way in the world am I going to be able to negotiate or develop a framework, a treaty framework, because I need to have a look at the weaknesses and the strengths of treaties. And so I had the, I had the benefit of being sent all over the world uh, to look at treaties. And uh, one of the most interesting treaty that I found, it wasn't a treaty, it was called an act of union. 
and that's what made Great Britain. And, uh, and it became Great Britain, um, and it became the Commonwealth of, of England. It, um, Britain became a union between Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, and, Brit and Britannia, and Britain. And I looked at that the arrangement, and that arrangement can fit and will work in Australia. But the problem will be, though, that all those Aboriginal nations will have to be given their own governance. So essentially, if it's going to work in this country, we have to get rid of the states of New South Wales, the Northern Territory, the states of South Australia. All those states have to disappear. And if we're going to uh, uh, take ownership like that, all the local governments, like your Ballina Shire Council, your Lismore Shire Council, they become obsolete. They're gone. And so then we have a national, have a parliament, a regional parliament, like here, for example, your Bunjalung, your Gumbanga people, and the Gidabal people. So you draw a big area around, and if they agree to treaty with each other as tribes, then they become the governing, er, governing people of this area with some of your guys non-Aboriginal people elected to that parliament as well. So then it becomes a joint management, joint control arrangement where we control this country the proper way. We look after country the proper way. And so these are the big challenges. This treaty process, they're trying to push it through now and rubber stamp it. But whatever people like myself and others are alive, there will be no treaty in this country. Not until we do it right. And so I'll leave it to you to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. It's really interesting to hear from people who are involved at the coalface and things like this. It makes our history alive and we're really grateful for having you here today. Thank you.